Hi, I'm Lisa Haysha. Welcome to the Legacy Interviews. Today on my couch, I have Suzanne Wong. Oh my God. Can you believe it? She's here live, the Suzanne Wong, the comedian, the actress, the writer, producer, uh, the person who survived a major health opportunity and friend, kind-hearted soul, lover of life and passion. I mean, she is everything she in sounds one awesome. package. <laughs> Don't you want to meet her? <laughs> Let's do. forget about introducing her <laughs> and meet her. <laughs> Who is this lady? Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Now you can look at me and okay, turn good. around. Yes. 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 <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. So good to have you back here. Thank you, friend. Yes, you have been such an inspiration to me since we met. Everything mm. about you, I adore and go, oh. We so, had an instant connection. We did. We did. We yeah. did. And I just want the audience to get who you are and how you have made it to where you are in part of your struggle, your journey, because nothing stops you and nothing slows you down. And if you don't like what happens to you, you say, no, thank you, not receiving. Right. So share. Well, that actually just reminds me of one of my favorite stories, which is um, a Zen Buddhist is walking through the forest, having a beautiful, peaceful, serene experience. And then a man comes up to him and starts to scream at him and swear at him and insult him and be degrading. And the entire time, the Zen Buddhist just seems happy and fine. So eventually, the abusive man just walks off in a huff, right? And the, there's a third person in the forest, someone who overheard the conversation, the dynamic. And he walks up to the Zen Buddhist and says, excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I just witnessed that conversation and he was so horrible to you and somehow you seem fine. How is that possible? And the Zen Buddhist said, let me ask you a question. If I get you a gift and I wrap it up and I present it to you and you refuse to accept it, who does it belong to? And the man said, well, it would still belong to you. And the Zen Buddhist said, exactly. I just chose not to accept his gift. And it's such a simple story, but to me it's, it's profound, powerful. it's powerful because abuse or anything negative that comes along is a gift that you have a choice really at any given moment to accept and, and eat it and rub it all over your body and, and feel awful. Yeah. Or you can go, oh, no thanks. Yes. You can keep that. Yes. I... And, and that's, that's sort of the way that I've, it's easier said than done and sometimes it's, you know, I, I'll forget. Yes. But when it comes to huge things, like, for example, cancer, breast cancer, stage four breast cancer, a diagnosis yeah, like that, this. You know, there you go. Yes. Here's Here, some stage four cancer this? for and you. Like, and I can go, oh, no, actually, okay. I'm good. You, you can just, you can keep that. And I don't accept that. So, so when you say that, that sounds so trivial or like, yeah, that's a lot of woo-woo talk, but it's not. For you, it's the truth. For me, it's not. So tell me, how did you get to that point? How, how do you create that reality? Hmm. Because you had stage four. You were cooked. Yes. So what? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know we don't have time for the whole journey. It's but a really long story, yeah. but um, it's a good question. How do, you, how do you get to that point? Was yeah. I always at that point? Did, did I come... Do you believe, for example, that we come into uh, planet Earth with yeah. a certain soul and personality and way of being? Is it nature or is it nurture? I think that I think that I came into the planet as a ballsy, optimistic, adventuresome, fearless person, and that was reinforced by having the gift, which I came to find out is rare. I thought when I was a little kid that all kids had parents who every day kissed them and hugged them and told them that they loved them and, and said, you're beautiful and smart and kind and amazing and you can accomplish anything that you want to in the world. That's how I was raised and I believed my parents. They, they made me laugh. They, they believed in me 100%. What about so going to friends' homes? Did you ever then see I would go anything? To then I would go to friends' homes and I would never see that. I thought that that was oh, what everyone had. Yes. And then I'd go to my friends' homes and I'd think, oh, what's, I don't understand what's happening here. These parents don't seem to be happy or like their children or love their children. Maybe there's not affection. There's not belief. 
and that breaks my heart. One of the reasons that I think that I'm now a speaker and a minister and a teacher and a coach is that um, I think that part of my being on the planet is to help people who maybe didn't have those parents learn that they can parent themselves and that at a certain point when you are calling yourself an adult, you have to stop blaming your parents for Amen what, to that. what you think yes. they said or did that messed you up. Yes. At a certain point, there are no victims, only yes. volunteers, yes. right? At a certain point, you can be the phoenix rising from the ashes. You can reparent yourself. And I can be a mother or father figure for whoever you are and help you realize that and help you tap into the fact that that the power uh, and the wisdom of the universe is all within you. There's that great quote. Um, it's a roomy quote. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a single drop, right? And that's what I believe each person is. One of the uh, rites of passage, I think, for me, because you know how some people in Jewish tradition, you have a bat mitzvah, you have a bar mitzvah where that, that's, your, that's how you know that you're an adult, supposedly. Well, Koreans don't have that. Um, but there was a moment when, I can't remember how old I was, maybe I was in my late 20s, when my mother told me the story. She said that when I was born, she and my father were both relatively new to the United States, and they were first-time parents. They were in their 20s themselves. Yes. They had no idea how to raise a baby. This was their first child, and they were so nervous, and they bought that book by Benjamin Spock about how to raise. Now it would be, now there's different people, yes. and different books that people read, but it was all about how to raise your child. And they, they had read one chapter about how if your baby is crying, in her crib at night, you do not go in there and pick her up every time she cries because she needs to learn to self-soothe, right? If you- I so don't agree with that. <laughs> so here's the thing. Yeah, yeah. They read that book that was written by some American yes. expert and they would, they, my mom told me that I would be crying in my crib at night and because they were trying to do the right thing, they would sit on their own bed and grab each other's hands really tightly to prevent the other one from going and picking me up when I was crying. And she said they would look at each other and cry. They would hold hands and cry because it was breaking their hearts not to go pick me up, but they were trying to do what the, the book the said. Right thing. And that was the right thing. And what just moves me so deeply about that is that who cares whether or not that was the right thing to do? The point is that they they were doing the best they could and they, they were trying to do the right thing by me. And that was the moment when I realized that my parents, it's not their only function on the planet to be my parents, they're just people, they're just human beings who are doing the best they could. And any mistake that I ever thought they made was just them as people. And that's how I first, felt like I was an adult when I started to see my parents as just people, human beings that are flawed, that are doing the best they could. So what advice would you give to someone who had a bad childhood experience and can't get over if my dad just never did this or if my mom did that or if my mom stuck up for me more or hmm. whatever the issue is? I come across that a lot. Yeah. Um, well, there's so many things you can do, but one of the things that I would love everyone to start doing is um, embracing the entire spectrum of human emotion and express, find healthy ways to express the emotion and not put a value judgment on certain emotions that are bad. And then these emotions are good and acceptable to talk about and express, right? So when it comes to things like anger or blame or resentment, if we aren't expressing and talking about them and processing them and releasing them, and there are many ways to do that, through therapy, through a trusted friend, through a, a spiritual advisor, through 12-step meetings, I mean, there's lots of ways. But to start by tapping into that anger, that blame, that resentment, that deep wound, and getting it up and out of you, right? Most of the time it's not 
healthy to get it up and out of you at the person that you're yes. upset with. Yes. However, it is really valuable to get it up and out of you because you know that emotions, toxic emotions, attach themselves if they're not expressed. They turn into injury, illness, yes. Yes. bankruptcy, your love, you know, your romance dissolves, you know, yes. all of that stuff. And so one of the steps would be to allow yourself to tap into the pain of it and get it up and out of you. One of the ways that people do that is through writing, it could be through speaking, it could be through creating some sort of art. You know, Picasso painted Guernica, which was this really disturbing commentary on war. So he, he painted his, do you know what I mean? And to find a way to get it up and out of you, that's number one. Um, a second part to that would be to give yourself the ideal response that you would want from that person if you were to, let's say you're mad at your father because your father did X, Y, and Z. So let's say that maybe even your father has passed, so there's not gonna be any conversation that you want to have with your father. You can get that up and out of you in many different ways, but you can also give yourself the ideal response, meaning you could write yourself a letter, Dear Lisa, the ideal response that you would want from your father after you had expressed yes. your truth. Dear Lisa, I'm so sorry that I hurt you. I was hurt myself. I know this is no excuse. It, it breaks my heart that I ever did anything. I was doing the best I could. Wh whatever you need to hear. to hear, I acknowledge that that happened and it's terrible and I'm so sorry and I beg your forgiveness or whatever you need, love dad and you give that to yourself, you give it to yourself. Because most people spend their lives delaying their happiness and serenity until some thing happens, some ideal fantasy yes, happens. Yes, yes. But you could give that to yourself. Absolutely, and you could. that's taking the power because if you sit on that, nothing in your life is ever gonna work and you're going, why I do the work or I show yeah. up but this relationship won't work, this person's flawed, that person's flawed. Yes. Look in the mirror if all your relationships yes. aren't working, there's something with you. Two, maybe not everything. Absolutely. Maybe you're picking flawed, really bad people because yes. you don't believe in yourself. You feel like you're damaged. Yes. Yes. So once you fix that, life yes. begins to flow. And if you get your rage up and out of you, you give yourself that ideal response, yes. then you can get to what we all want to get to, which is forgiveness. Yes. And to me, forgiveness is like a divine scissors that cuts the toxic umbilical cord between you and another person. Yes. Right? And if you can, if but I don't think you can forgive without releasing the challenging emotion, the toxic emotion, giving yourself the ideal response that you need and wish for. And then you can release yourself from it. Because if you think of your happiness, let's say that you're a helium balloon, but you're tethered to a piece of concrete, and the concrete is, all that stuff that's holding yes. you back, all of your resentments. That forgiveness is cutting that string so that you can soar, so that you can float, so that you're not weighed down. There's this great expression, resentment is like drinking a glass of poison and then waiting for the other person to die. Yes. Right, the people that we resent, so most true. of them don't know and they don't They're care anyway. It over, and over and over again for years, and the other person has right. no idea. Right. Yes. And also, let's break down the word resent. Resent. Meaning, there was that experience, right? Yes. But we're going to resend it to ourselves over Every and five over. minutes we're for gonna, the rest gonna, of your I'm life. I'm going to resend that trauma yeah. back to myself. Yes. Really? Why yeah. are we doing that? You know, there's another expression. We can look at the past, but don't stare because it's rude. We can look at the past and learn from it, but let's move forward because that's if you're brilliant. staring at it, then that's where you're That's living. where you're going to live. And do you really want to live there? Well, talk a little bit about getting anger out. I'm assuming you're an advocate for <laughs> like pounding on pillows There's so or many screaming. Different ways. Yes. yes, you can so. write a, a livid letter. I did yes. this many years ago with somebody that I was really angry at. I wrote a 20 page single spaced handwritten letter to him that I never intended to send. That way I, would, I wouldn't censor myself. I just got it all up and out of me. I mean, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you how far I went. It included, I felt so physically violent towards him and I'm not a violent person. But it included me saying in this letter that I then ripped up and burned, dear X, 
and then I just went crazy. Fuck you for doing this to me and doing that to me and you're horrible and you lied and you did this and you were abusive and you insulted blah, 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 blah. I want to cut off your cock, put it through a meat grinder, shove it in your mouth, duct tape it and make you swallow it. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's getting right? it out. I got it up and out. <laughs> that's and then I out. ripped that letter up and yeah. I burned it. Mm -hmm. And now it's not inside of But me. how did you feel? How long did it take you to feel the release? Well, well it wasn't just that. So that's one thing yeah. you can do is write a, an angry letter, rip it up and burn right. it, right? Um, there's also a bunch of other things. So I'm a big fan of primal screaming where I relax my throat. Okay, I love that. That's you know, what I wanted to hear. Yes. Oh, when you yawn, mm -hmm. the back of your throat is completely yeah. relaxed. Because if you start screaming and you are tense, yes. you're going to destroy your vocal cords. And then I just open up and let a wail out. And most of the time it starts as rage, but I think anger is a cover emotion and that underneath it is hurt and sadness yes, and of grief course. and of fear, course. right? Yeah. So every time I've ever done Primal Scream to release rage, it always eventually turns into crying because there's a deep sadness underneath that. It's like anger is the hardcover shell. Yes. That's, you know, and until you can get rid of that, yes. you can't get access to the Yeah, because I was going to say, some people stuff. write the letters, but they're still not because they still, right. that's step one. Right. Then now let's do the deep work. Now you've right. forgiven and you're open to let's heal yes, yes, and get it out. Yes. You can also, um, some people love to run. They get a runner's high mm -hmm. from physical yes. exercise. You can, you can hit a heavy bag. Yes. You know, put you know, protect yourself with some of course. boxing gloves. Um, some people go to the Salvation Army or Goodwill and get really cheap plates, cups and plates and saucers, and then go smash them. <laughs> Break them. Smash <laughs> them. Find a safe place to smash them. Yeah. Now, because I don't like to clean up afterwards, yeah. I've done this where I take some hefty bags and I put the stuff inside the hefty bags and then tie the hefty bag, right, like a big, thick garbage bag. And then I go to my backyard and I... And I, so I get the feeling and the sensation of smashing the stuff, but afterwards it's all <laughs> already in the garbage bag. So I have to clean up tiny shards of that have, that have just gone everywhere yes. all over the place. You know what I mean? Oh, that's brilliant. So yeah, that, great, and great advice. Some people, I don't like this one, but you can take a towel and fold it mm -hmm. in half and then in half and then in half. And then and then twist and wring it like you're maybe strangling somebody. One yeah. thing that is very effective for me because I've had a lot of rage in my life from being treated as less than because I'm Asian, because I'm female, because I'm physically petite. And people going, oh, just, you, sh you know, just be quiet and, and sit in the back and, and look pretty. And not being taken seriously and not feeling like I get to claim my power. So I've had a lot of rage about that. So I have a plastic bat that you can get at any toy store, like a wiffle ball bat. And then sometimes I will take it to my mattress. I have okay. one of I have yes. one of those That's memory foam mattresses, yes. right? Yes. And I put yes. somebody's face, usually it's someone, okay. someone's face there, <laughs> and I beat Found the one. living shit out of them. Sometimes while I'm also vocalizing, and I might be yelling at the person. Because these are things that I don't do to the person. Clearly that's not healthy. Of course. For me to actually beat the shit out of somebody or scream my primal rage at them. However, one good thing about doing that is that after doing that, it's only after doing that that you can get to the place where you realize, okay, what of that is necessary for me to communicate to that person? Because all of that certainly is not necessary. But is there some piece, some kernel of truth that is important that I communicate to that person? But you can't get to that until you get all the, do you know yeah, what I mean? The I charge off of it. Bat and beat a pillow or a yes. couch in here. Yes. And once they do that, they go, God, that wasn't even really bothering so much. It was just hanging on to it. It was like their wounded inner child hanging on to it. But right. they wanted to move past it. And that got them past it. Right. But they don't even have the issue anymore. Right. And then but, they can go to forgiveness. But they might get to the point where only through doing that can they get yes. to some kernel of truth that is important, that they yeah. uncovered, that they learned about themselves, that they can now share with the person that they're yes. upset with. So th those are some examples of things that you can do. You can also put the person in a chair and imagine them there. And instead of doing a letter writing exercise, you can put them in the chair and just go to town 
what is everything that you've ever wanted to say to that person? Yeah, and say then, it. And say it. Yeah. Find your voice. So many women especially end up with um, losing their voices or getting sick or having throat issues or because they literally aren't speaking their truth or having their voice, right? I have a sore throat, I have a cough, oh my I God. have laryngitis, Yes. right? So it's because there's no, there's no, in their, in their world view, safe way for them to get so that up with and you out. having issues as a child or from the, just your, you know, being Asian and whatever, petite, how did you still follow your passion and become so successful in so many different fields? I think I was, I really do think I was born with a certain amount of courage. And then the feeling of unconditional love from my parents, I think reinforced any courage that I already had. Uh, and education is very important in Korean culture, so I was valedictorian of my high school because of course I was, and I loved school, and I was great at it, and I enjoyed learning, and then I got a BA in psychology at Yale. I got a master's in cognitive psychology. Okay, at Brown. I want to back up a little. When you said, "Of course I am," you know, because that's like all Asians' mentality. I have friends who are in Asian schools. They go, "My kid can't keep up. All the Asians are getting so many A's, A's." It's A's. part of the culture. It's taught that it's important. But didn't and you so go with to school with all these other Asians that felt the same way? And you no, still? No, I oh. didn't. Um, my high school was half black, half white. Me and Judy Chang. Oh, so. Everyone, so of course, and, so, yes. And by the course, way, yes. people came up to me and said, hi, Judy. Hi, Judy. Or I met your sister, Judy. Judy Chang was Chinese. I'm Korean. She wore glasses. I don't. She was about a foot shorter than me, and she had short hair, and I had long hair. But yes, I'm Judy. Yeah. You, know you look I mean? the same. You're both Asian, so you're the same right. person. Right, and there was yes. a lot of this, like, can't you tell you apart. Yeah. You know, yeah. so no. That, that I was not surrounded by ah, Asians okay. in school. Okay. In fact, I didn't even realize I was different because you know how little kids are colorblind, yes. they'll just play with anybody. It wasn't until junior high school when uh, Henry Jackson called me a chink. And I, I didn't know what that meant, but it didn't feel good. So I went home and asked my mom and dad, you know, what that is. And they said that, that was a bad word for a Chinese person. So the next time I saw him, I said, I'm not a chink, I'm a gook. Because I, I, I wanted him to get it right. Korean. If you're going to insult me, use the right thing. Yes, yes. And I also, I don't know if you know this, That's but um, I love studying the etymology of words and phrases. So I wanted to understand, I understand why Chinese people would be called chink as a derogatory term, C-H-I-N mm -hmm. something, and Japanese are called Japs. I'm thinking, why are Koreans called gooks? I don't understand, like, where does where that come, come from? from? So I traced it back to the Korean War, where the Koreans would say to the American soldiers, Miguk, because in Korean, Miguk means, are you American? But they thought that the Koreans were saying, Mi Gook, like, you Tarzan, yeah, 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 Mi yeah, yeah. Gook. So they went, oh, hi, Gook. gook. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that, so that stuck. Yeah. And then, I don't know if you know this, but by the time they got to the Vietnam War, I guess the American soldiers got lazy with their slurs because they were like, to the Vietnamese, you guys are gooks, too. I don't know. We, we yeah, can't think of anything. Asian we can't think of anything. Yeah. So, but this, this is what bothers me. Gook, Koreans and Vietnamese, we, we're so low on the racial totem pole that we have to share our slur right. with another country. <laughs> we don't even get our I own. Want my own slur. Fuck that. <laughs> Give me my own slur. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I decided that we can we we can change the power of words and their meaning and the way we interpret them and respond to them. So, for example, in Black culture. When you hear people cut, hey, what's up, my nigga? Hey, nigga. And it's used as a term of endearment, where it used to be used yes. as something hateful. Well, I decided to do that with the word gook. So I decided to start overusing it. Overuse it. Tell people, call me, what's up, my gook? How's my favorite gook? Or I would sign my emails, yours gookly, or in gooks we trust, or America's favorite gook. And it started to sound funny to me. I'm desensitizing myself. I'm taking the charge off the word by using it all the time and using it as a term of endearment, right? And now that word doesn't have power over me anymore. It's also fascinating how 
words change meaning over time. Yes. Or depending on what context, yeah, what country, it, what culture. Yeah. Right. So did you know that the word cunt comes from the root word that means goddess? Sort of like K-U-N-D and Kundalini. Cunt comes from the root word that means goddess. Look what we've done to the meaning of that word. Now it's the worst thing yes. that you can call a woman. It yes. means goddess. So I encourage people when, you know, women, if, you're get, if you get called a cunt, you're supposed to go, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Take it as a compliment. You'll just completely confuse people who yeah. are trying to harm you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And what a different way to take that in. Yes, thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Namaste. Blessings. Yes. <laughs> right? And so, so isn't it interesting that, again, just like we were talking about at the beginning, yes. with the no thank you, you can keep that gift. Someone's trying to give you something yucky and you can receive it in not the way that they yes. wanted you to receive it. How amazing. I even remember being in junior high school and having kids say, you're weird because I'm imaginative and maybe they think that that's strange or I have a lot of energy or uh, I'm all over the place. And they would say, you're weird. And I would say, thank you. Because what's the alternative? I'm not Normal, weird. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or just I'm boring yes. or I'm average or I'm normal. So I would say thank you and then they'd look at me unhappy because they were trying to So you upset were like me. this early on. I was. I was. People would say although when when there was this kind of thing, because I was so tiny, first of all I skipped two grades, so I was two years younger than everyone else. So I'm two years I started uh, high school at twelve and college at sixteen. So I'm tiny and flat chested and brainiac and I'm not gonna be physically overpowering someone who teases me, right? But I'm smart and I got a wicked tongue. <laughs> witted. So yes. that was my that was my defense. And now it's become Your a career, career in stand up comedy, right? Yes. 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 And isn't it funny that basically now uh, being raised as somebody who I felt like, oh, Asian petite female. What do I do for a living? Blah, I'm just yes. talking nonstop. I feel like I was put on the planet to have life experiences, learn from them, and then talk. I agree. Absolutely. You're a genius at that. You're a genius at that. <sighs> so tell me about what you're doing now. Okay. Uh, I'm doing many things now. I'm writing a book about my journey reversing stage 4 breast cancer. And I did it with a combination of Western medicine, Eastern medicine, holistic, alternative, homeopathic, illegal, revolutionary treatments. I traveled to Italy. I went half a million dollars into debt. I learned life lessons. I changed what I eat, what I drink, what I think. I meditate now. I laugh a lot. I had to slow down and ask for and receive help and love. That's sort of the spiritual life lesson that I think was a major factor in me getting better. So in Asian culture, it's considered disgusting and tacky and low class to talk about your problems in public. In, in Middle Eastern culture too. Right? Yes. You're supposed to just go, we were brought up like oh that. no, no, yeah. everything perfect. Yes. Okay, don't worry. No, don't worry, everything perfect. Even though I was born in this country, that heritage is still in me, I'm affected by the, the belief system that you're just supposed to act like everything's perfect and fine. It's like being a recovering Asian is like being a recovering perfectionist, right? right? Oh my God. Everything yeah. is not perfect. Yes, yes, yes. So I realized that for the first five years I had breast cancer, I kept it a secret. I'm in the public eye. I didn't go public about it because I was ashamed. I felt embarrassed and ashamed that I had cancer as if the that I couldn't figure out a cure for cancer immediately, I should be ashamed of myself and embarrassed. And I was suffering in, in solitude and silence. I mean, there were a, core, a group of core people that knew. But finally, I was convinced to come out of the cancer closet and talk about, talk about it. And I thought, no, I have to wait until I've cured myself. And then I'll speak and tell everybody what I did. No, how about this? How about why don't you let us in while you're navigating your way through this? Because you're doing it with courage and vulnerability and humor. So why not let people in on your journey as you're going through it? Because people need you now. People are going through stuff like this now. So I did a 
press release, I did an NBC News interview, and I really just laid it all out there. Going from being the super successful television host and actor who had it all together to just laying it all out yes, there was it yes. was terrifying. However, of course, and you think about God. Will anyone ever hire me again? Am I ruining my reputation? Yes. Oh, she's the sick one. We can't yes. take a chance. Yes. And on will her. she always, from now on, only be known as yeah. the tit cancer mm -hmm. girl? Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, that'll be awful. Uh, but I realized I'm so multifaceted that that would only happen if that's what my intention was, mm -hmm. and that's what I allowed it to be. And so it's just one aspect of my very colorful, amazing, adventurous life. And what happened was the outpouring of love and support. I think it's also important for people, interestingly enough, to see that celebrities are not perfect people with perfect lives that they wish they had. There's something really amazing and remarkable about having somebody who other people think is on top of the world and they're comparing their, their insides to other people's outsides. Yes. Right? That I get, I would I allow you to see my insides? Or believing someone's Facebook page that that's all they that's are. That's all they are. Yeah, they have that's, no bad days, no, no bad hair days. Everything goes perfectly perfect. for them. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yes. And I got an outpouring of love and support that really moved me. And one of my life lessons that it took stage four, not one, two, or three, stage four breast cancer, because you know there is no stage five. Stage four is the worst. Stage five is you're dead. Yes. It took stage four for me to get rid of my stubborn tendency to only give and not receive. So, oh, it's my job to save and rescue and fix and heal everyone else, teach, mentor, do it, be the, you know, all the arrows pointing outward to the point where I would be exhausted and just collapse and then resent the people that I'm supposedly helping, many of whom didn't even ask me yeah. <laughs> to help them, right? And being having stage four cancer and everything that I went through, I was basically in bed for three months, couldn't move. I had had multiple breast surgeries and back surgery and hip replacement surgery. I had finally, after doing a bunch of holistic things that didn't seem to be working, added in some radiation, an oral form of chemo called Zolota that's not as toxic as the intravenous chemo, but I was just floored. I couldn't even get out of bed to go to the bathroom. I needed help. So I had two choices. Uh, you could shit the bed or you could have people come over to your house and help you because you need help. And as soon as I did that, I, th I was worried that my friends would see that as a burden and just, you know, run like, run for the hills and the opposite happened. I found that out that every single friend of mine in LA that I thought was my friend really was. My family came, my friends came. There were times that there were 20 people at my house at the same time. Some people were cleaning the house, walking and feeding my dog, preparing food, just uh, coming into my bedroom and telling me jokes or singing me songs or bringing over funny movies. and. And I, it was like my heart got cracked open. And all that love that I let come in is what really started to heal me. And So are you under the belief that if you did not express this and share this with people who care about you, you may not have survived? Yes. Wow, now I'm, the power of love. It's all about love, I isn't was, it? I was loved back to life. Yes. And, and sometimes you feel I'm not worthy because I'm going through all this and who am I to be a burden on others? Who am I to, Yes. what have I ever done for these people? Have I got, they haven't had an opportunity for me to, just all these, what I call imposters in your head saying you don't deserve it. Just deal with your own shit, you know? That's not anyone else's problem. And that's illusion, which I found out. So we gotta tell people, ask yes. for help. Yes. Ask and, for help. And. Every woman that I've ever spoken to who has or had breast cancer has a history of taking care of everyone yes. but themselves. They were last on the list. In my life, I wasn't even last on the list. I wasn't on the list. Mm -hmm. Before breast cancer, I used to sleep about three hours a night. I never meditated. I never exercised. I didn't drink water. I would, would eat junk food. I would, eat, I would eat junk food. I just, and then I would just do every, I would be all things to all people. Be all things to all people. I would say yes when I meant no all the time. 
anyone who wanted to be my friend who needed something from me, I would just say, sure. Including toxic, what I would now call 911 friends. Who all the time there's <laughs> some sort that. of there's yes, some so yes. what fucking thing is yeah, it now yeah. and I would just drop everything yeah. and run over. So that's interesting. So what is the difference between asking for help when something I know the answer to this, but I want you to asking for help when someone really needs something, you know, like you needed help with cancer, and asking for help the nine one one friend. Because I think those get diluted. The nine one one friend has never been there for <clears> you. And is only only interacts with you when they need something for you. To me, that's the difference. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I consider it something like I call it money in the bank, right? If you and I have been there for each other through thick and thin in our friendship, and then you call me at three in the morning and you need something, I'm there. There's a big difference between that and somebody whose only dynamic with you has ever been their drama and their chaos. And, and they, they don't even contact you unless they need something from you. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And one of the things that I found astonishing and so revelatory, because I can think of myself, you know, I have two Ivy League degrees, I studied psychology, I'm a minister, I'm a published author, I'm so smart, I understand Award human nature. Right. <laughs> but here's Emmy what happened. Emmy-nominated actress. I was, I was <laughs> concerned that I would be burdening my friends and I didn't want to ask for help. And they, my friends came over and said, not only are you not burdening us, you've been jipping us out of half of a friendship. And I didn't even know what that meant. Yeah, when we're not doing well, we tell you and you rush in and you love us back to life. When you're not doing well, you don't tell anybody. And you don't give us the joy that we could feel to reciprocate, to rush in and love you back to life. Your honest life experience when you're not doing well, thank you for telling us so that we can come in and rush in and reciprocate. So no one came begrudgingly. No one came you know, thinking, okay, what do you need? You pain in the ass. People came and, like you said, made jokes, made food, walked your dog, sang songs, cheered you up. Everything, everything. So my question would be then, especially in this town, how do you cultivate a friendship? Mm. So many people are lonely here. It's the mm. loneliest city in the world because mm. everyone's so into it. I mean, we only have like two minutes left. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. Okay. Then, so we're going to answer this quickly. Then I have to ask you what okay. you like So how do you um, develop a friendship and okay. keep a friendship, especially uh, 20, 30, 40 friendships. I feel like there's nothing more valuable in the human experience than true friendship because romances come and go. Yes. But there are friendships that do last a lifetime. And I think that the way to cultivate beautiful friendships is to come from a place of authenticity yourself. If you are being authentic, then you will magnetize towards you other people whose authentic selves resonate with your authentic self. Love that. You know, Brene Brown says in her TED talk about the power of vulnerability that humans are hardwired to crave connection, and the only rewarding connection is authentic connection. And the only authentic connection you can have is if you're coming from a place of vulnerability. And so think of how much better my friendships are now that I was of vulnerable course. and I of said, course, I, I'm, I'm in trouble, I need help. Yes. Will you come and help me? And then to allow myself to receive it. And by the way, it was unbearable at first. It was really hard for me. People would come over and I'd be like, uh, right. I can't take all this love. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Of course. It was, it was really hard for me at first. And, and, and now, uh, now it just feels like an incredible gift and blessing and, and a huge life lesson that I've learned. So what do you want your legacy to be? <sighs> hmm. I think what it already is, which is having life experiences, learning from them, and sharing them. And maybe to be known as the best friend you could ever want. Oh, I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Thank Suzanne. You. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been I'm so awesome. glad you're my friend. I'm so glad you're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I did call on you when I needed you. Yeah, yes. And you took me to the dentist. Yes. And you took, yeah. Yes. Took care of me. And you were there. I love you. I love you. Mm.